Hello, my name is Anahid Ugurlayan, and I am co-chair of the Armenian Bar Association's Domestic Violence Committee. This committee began its work at the start of the pandemic in March 2020 to address the scourge of domestic violence in Armenia and the diaspora. The committee seeks to increase access to justice for victims of domestic violence of Armenian descent internationally, strengthen the existing domestic violence law in Armenia to better protect victims of domestic violence, including children, and provide support to non-governmental organizations, nonprofit organizations, and other activists in Armenia on campaigns and projects to educate the citizens of Armenia on the deleterious impact of domestic violence. The committee also raises awareness about domestic violence in diaspora and communities. The Armenian Bar Association's Domestic Violence Committee and the American University of Armenia's Human Rights and Social Justice and Gender Studies minor programs are pleased to announce a webinar series entitled Women and Women's Rights in Armenia, the Past, the Present, and the Future. The series consists of three lectures. Uh, by scholars, experts, and practitioners in the field of women's rights, human rights, and social justice with longstanding research and practice in the field. The webinar series intends to provide a platform for activists, uh, lawmakers, scholars, and women's rights advocates to learn about women's rights in their historical development and present day challenges, as well as share information on the importance, um, uh, issues of importance to women. We will start with the past, and our speaker is Dr. Hazmi Khalapian. Uh, Dr. Hazmi Khalapian is an assistant professor at the American University of Armenia. She has an MA from Miami University of Ohio in English literature and a PhD in history from Central European University, Budapest, Hungary. Her original research is on the Armenian women's movement in the Ottoman Empire from 1876 to 1914, for which she has carried out research in the archives and libraries of Armenia, Austria, France, and Turkey. Her research interests include concepts and histories of social change in local and global perspective, Ottoman history, women's movements worldwide in comparative perspective, theories and histories of empires and colonialism, gender and international law, uh, ideologies and education policies in the early Soviet period. She has also spent many years researching e-learning methodologies, especially in their relation to e-teaching uh, language and history. She has been published in international journals and edited volumes on the topics of history, 19th century theater, uh, diaspora and e-learning and has been translated um, to Turkish. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Halapian. Yes, thank you very much, Anait, for this introduction. I'm excited to co-launch this series that will hopefully help advance women's rights. Um, I'm aware of the limited time that I have to speak about this huge topic, so I will uh, try to give a comprehensive summary of what was uh, termed as women's question in the 19th century. Firstly, by illustrating the link between the nation's question and woman's question, and then focus on the areas of women's activism. I will start with a little bit of historical background just to put things in perspective. Over the course of the 19th century, several political events greatly impacted the way Armenian reformers in the Ottoman Empire came to imagine the Armenian nation and how to modernize in its institutions. Uh, among these events were the Russian occupation of Eastern Armenia in 1828, reforms in the Ottoman Empire known as Tanzimat reforms between 1839 to 1876, uh, granted, which practically granted more cultural autonomy to its subjects, and the French Revolution of 1848. The rising group of urban Armenian reformers in response to new socioeconomic developments and intensified European cultural and economic penetration strive to create a distinctive Armenian space with middle class cultural ideals and beliefs, both in Constantinople and in the provinces. A set of new universal terms, uh, terms such as liberty, equality, humanism, and progress became popularized and were used in the new definition of national identity, and the national constitution was adopted in 1863. 
The woman's question was debated within the general context of a cultural awakening and national project uh, pro progress that a handful of educated Armenians envisioned for the Armenian community in the Ottoman Empire. So national progress, civilization, and women's status were increasingly rendered as interwoven. According to um, Grigor Odian, one second, yes, you can see the quote here. Uh, he, Odian was the co-author uh, of the Armenian constitution and later also the Ottoman constitution of 1876. Uh, Odian wrote on the pages of Byzantium. And I'm quoting, history shows a tight link between the issue of woman's emancipation and nation civilization. It is the odds and ends of old barbarity preserved in contemporary societies that restrains a woman's destiny. Laws must be changed. A woman must have balanced rights. The rights of one sex should not be the deprivation of the other sex. End of quote. So women were seen as the mothers of the nation and in this role, they had to be educated and integrated in the overall campaign for the moral and physical well-being of the nation. Uh, um, a report uh, of Education Council of the National Assembly addressed to the patriarch in 1871, uh, for example, uh, made a case for women's education by stating that, quote, a child's education must begin from the crib. But how can we do that without educated mothers, end of quote. Efforts were made by reformers to transform and elevate domesticity into a modern profession that would be suitable for the modern woman and attractive to middle and upper class women. Motherhood and wifehood were prefer referred to as um, scientific occupations and further encouraged through publication of information on family and children's health. Uh, you, and these were issues uh, in which uh, women's role was really emphasized. The ideal new woman in the private sphere, that would be the home, otherwise, uh, had to be multi-skilled and multitasking to appear, quote, both as the servant and the queen of the home, uh, end of quote. She was to direct her efforts to the improvement of, quote, our morals, educate our children, and become models of gracefulness and decency, end of quote. The middle and upper class women were called upon to simplify their lifestyles to correspond to the new middle class ideals as envisioned by the reformers. Love for simplicity, known as Barza Sirutyun in, Haere, in Armenian, sorry, was the slogan of the day. They were asked to end their leisure and luxurious lifestyles and contribute their time to charity and social work. For middle class women, the new public sphere was twofold. On the one hand, it signaled their entry into paid labor. On the other hand, as the group of educated women who stood closer to the crowds, quote unquote, um, than the upper classes, they were asked to directly participate in the modernization of women of their own class and classes below them through educating them for the new roles. For the urban lower classes, the new public sphere meant mandated education, often vocational, which guaranteed their entry into paid household or factory labor. For the pro provincial lower classes, a partial shift occurred from agrarian labor to industrial household or factory labor. Often they were called to be the true feminists because the pub their public visibility had occurred much earlier. So the remarkable aspect of the assessment of women's new identity was that it was achieved through comparison with and in relation to Europe. The definition of new woman uh, was often borrowed from Europe, but the Armenian woman was expected to preserve her decency. And I'm quoting from Arevelian Mamul, a newspaper that was published uh, in Smyrna. Uh, and it, it, it had the longest life of all the newspapers that were published uh, in the Ottoman Empire by Armenians. Uh, although of high social status, greatly educated and in possession of selective gifts of European enlightenment, as true Armenian women, they, referring to a group of Armenian women, are exemplary models of Armenian simplicity, humbleness and decency. Whenever selective education and enlightenment are combined with indigenous national features, the Armenian woman comes out of it as super noble and acts out of her moral consciousness.
on that code. So the word selective occurring twice in this small quote is the key word here, which pretty much denotes that there were limits to how much the woman could be emancipated to the extent that the woman had to be emancipated. The new Armenian woman um, was um, practically uh, invited to, had to emerge out of this movement as modern yet modest. So how did women react to this invitation? Surely many of them were happy to grab the momentum and turn it into an opportunity to claim their public visibility. The activism of women was developing in four distinct areas. And you can see here on the slide, those areas were education, public roles through charity, access to paid labor and improvement of family culture and marriage law. And law here should be actually in quotation marks because there was no marriage law in the time that I'm covering. So going to education, first starting from education, uh, as I already said, um, uh, education was seen as key to improvement of women's status in the society. The constitution of 1863 made women's education mandatory. And here, here you on the slide, you see a quote from article three of the constitution, which claims that it is the obligation of the nation to take care of moral, intellectual and material needs of her nationals. And it is the obligation of the nation to spread knowledge essential to mankind to boys and girls equally. Up to the fall of the empire, the foundation of the schools among Armenians materially was dependent on philanthropy and organizationally on numerous associations. The initial care that the reformer men took to educate women and improve the situation of the needy gradually was handed to the educated women. The period was marked by the mushrooming of women's associations or societies. In the, in the preliminary stages of public activism, women found, founded various auxiliaries to already existing national institutions run by men. New reform, um, new forms of, one second, changing the slide, yes. New forms of organizing emerged in 1870s, starting especially with the foundation of two major women's education organizations, the Patriotic Armenian Women's Association, Asganaver Hayuhats and Gerutsun, and Social uh, School Lobbying Ladies Association, the Protsas Erdiknats and Gerutsun, both of which were established in 1879 with only one month difference. In this new type of organization, women did not anymore appear in the auxiliary position of caring for the needy, but they were the decision makers in the provision of education and care. Both as associations defined it as their mission to promote women's education in provinces. The Patriotic Women's Association, as Ganaver Hayuhats and Gerutun, was to establish girls' schools in the provinces. This organization was associated with the name of Sibyl, uh, Zabela Satur, one of our most famous uh, women activists or feminists. And the School Loving Ladies Association, uh, the foundation of which was associated with the name of Serpuhit Yusap and her mother Nazla Bahan, was founded to promote the education of vulnerable Armenians as well as prepare female teachers for the provinces. So you can see that they tried not to duplicate each other, even though they were both devoted and were striving to contribute to education. Both organizations were instrumental for the Armenian authorities and reformers in spreading education among females and in caring for the poor. You can see numerous letters addressed to them in which uh, patriarch, the authorities, asked them to address special needs of women in special part of the empire, depending when uh, the need uh, emerged at that particular moment in history. Uh, their role cannot be overstated. Um, Arpiar Arpiarian in 1899 writes on the pages of Nur Gyang uh, that he was publishing in London that um, together with Niatyal and Gerutyun, another organization run by men that was um, also uh, uh, organizing education within the empire, along with Niatyal and Gerutyun, these two women's organization together uh, educated more than 60,000 boys and girls in Armenia, and thanks to them, 
quote, Armenians learned to read, to write, to count the national history and the principles of sciences for free when the state that is ruling us with all its power failed to do the same for its own rural population, end of quote. Uh, so um, uh, the, the state meaning the Ottoman Empire, yes. Campaign for Education opened up new discourse on the need for women to claim their rights for paid labor, both for economic reasons and for financial self-sufficiency, because it was believed that women cannot be emancipated until they earn their own living. In general, the history of women's labor shows that women's paid labor develops along with the economy, when industrialization pushes women out of the household and onto the market, especially as the employers realize the economic value of women's cheap or cheaper labor. Up to its decline, the Ottoman Empire remained largely an agrarian state, with the three quarter, qu quarters of the Ottoman population living in the countryside and drawing living from agriculture related activities. So economically, the setting was not very favorable to the development of female job market, labor market. The second biggest constraint for on, on the way of women's uh, paid labor was ideological slash cultural that had to do with the gender segregation of space that was practiced in the Ottoman society. There were laws banning the appearance of men and women together in public. Men and women had to occupy different sections of the ferry boats and trains and many other uh, constraints like this. The administrative division of Constantinople further restricted the already limited mobility of women. Constantinople was divided into quarters or districts that were called mahales. Uh, there, uh, there was a concept of integration and self-sufficiency attached to the mahales, normally through having the most basic establishments and services necessary for the daily lives of the inhabitants uh, that would for example, the religious center, a public fountain, a shop, etc. So Eldem notes in his study of the city that he calls this parasitic giant, the Constantinople, that with the exception of a very limited number of socially privileged people, the self-sufficiency of the Mahales necessarily meant a limited mobility for its inhabitants, including women. This also meant closer social control of especially women's lives under the watchful eyes of the inhabitants of the quarter. So Haiganush Mark, uh, another um, famous uh, female uh, author and, and just a very active uh, woman of the time, a feminist of the time, uh, blamed the public opinion for the unwillingness of women to um, take any initiative. And you see the quote on the slide uh, that she published in Zarik um, newspaper that she was herself editing. Um, uh, what will others say as if there were the silent scarecrow of the public opinion in these three words, which threatened you and which though meaningless, nevertheless force you to rethink. A human being in all circumstances is subjected to the imaginary questioning of this scarecrow, which almost never forgives the person dissociating themselves from the convention." End of quote. So in the meantime, women's even economic participation was becoming a pressing issue for the families economically. Under the immense socioeconomic change, the middle class families were rapidly impoverishing. So since the status of the family was judged by the amount of leisure available to a woman, a middle class woman's work necessarily emphasized the economic vulnerability of the families that the latter desperately tried to hide. As shameful as it was, women did step into the job market for economic or ideological reasons, into the limited professions that were available to them. And here you see the list of the uh, professions that were available to women. Teaching was uh, socially very inclusive. That practically meant that a family, a, a, a girl from a lower class family could get educated and she would herself would become a teacher. 
Uh, and this was also the one of the most feminized professions and uh, sought after professions at the time. Um, medical nurses uh, was another uh, opportunity for women, but this was largely unpopular, uh, despite the fact that at least two feminists, Zarui Kalankerian and Kayane Matakian, really tried very hard to popularize the profession, you know, especially that there was the demand of nurses uh, in the uh, Surpurkic uh, National Hospital. Holy Savior National Hospital. Um, the domestic service was largely limited to the urban and rural poor. The rural poor mostly were migrant women who would leave behind their, their children and move to Constantinople to support their families. Acting uh, was also socially inclusive because here we see that actresses were from a variety of fields, but this really doesn't fit very well into the whole theory of women's work because this was such a unique opportunity for the Armenian women because Armenian women were the only um, uh, female actors uh, in the Ottoman Empire because the religious leaders of other communities of the Ottoman Empire, such as the Muslim, the Greek and Jewish, did not allow their women to step onto the stage. So uh, the other thing that made this uh, career as very unique for Armenian women was that uh, this was uh, theater was the only industry that uh, where women's wages were higher than the wages of men and actresses were getting more money than actors were. Writing was another opportunity for women um, limited to a group of educated women who were encouraged usually by a male member of the family or a friend of the family to participate in the making of um, a public opinion in print. And they were getting honorarium for this and the analysis of the lives and biographies of some feminists uh, allows to conclude that um, this was a means of um, earning money for many of them. And needlework uh, was perhaps the most popular as here the ideology and economy happily overlapped or happily met because women could make money without having to leave the home through this purely female occupation. Okay. Um, yes, and family was another area that women uh, tried to bring change onto, into. In the course of the 19th century, marriage was a religious act uh, carried out and registered by the local church. Uh, marriage was regarded as a contractual relation between two families rather than the marrying couple. The common mood in the period, both among religious and secular authorities and the reformers, was that the family was deteriorated by marriage vices, aratner, that needed to be removed from the Armenian culture. Among the vices to fight against, the authorities and reformers identified child or early marriage. The most criticized age-related practice was Beshikertme, which was an agreement between the families of infants to have their children marry when they reached puberty. Uh, cases of Beshi Kertme, uh, despite the prohibition in 1811, were reported as late as in 1906. And this is only according to my sources. This might go beyond that. I, am, I have a feeling. <laughs> Uh, dowry was considered yet another vice by the authorities and reformers. Uh, dowry was officially forbidden by the Patriarchate in 1850s, but the practice continued. Dowry was considered to be the reason behind the decline in marriage rate, particularly among the socially more vulnerable families. It was also considered to be um, the reason behind uh, the, the kidnap of women because trying to evade paying the uh, bashluk, which literally means um, head price, they were, um, uh, sometimes women would get uh, just kidnapped and forced into marriage. Religious conversion, as well as appeals to Muslim courts, mostly by women, were of great concern to the religious and secular authorities and reformers. And this was largely due, due uh, due to the fact that Armenians themselves did not have a law on divorce and very often Armenian women would take their 
case to the Muslim Qadil courts, which were really where it was really easy to get divorced. Um, uh, there were also occasions when they were converted to Greek Orthodoxy and then reconverted back and eventually to stop this uh, practice, the church, the Armenian church um, made, made it prohibited reconversions. So once you've converted, you can't reconvert. Uh, but um, this did not have a great impact on the rate of religious conversions. Polygamy was perhaps um, uh, perceived as the most alarm alarming unchristian vice. Uh, the cases of it were repeatedly reported in the provinces and the patriarchate seemed to be especially concerned for this um, uh, cause. Legally, family and marriage disputes were subjected to arbitrary case-by-case -case decisions with the involvement of multiple authorities. These problems were regularly discussed at the National Assembly, but no comprehensive marriage law existed up until the fall of the empire. On the pages of the periodical press, through public debates, the reformers recognized that the biggest victims of marriage vices were women. So Levon Bachalian wrote on the pages of Pyrenik in 1894, it is impossible to deny that family and love dramas have increased in number in the Armenian society recently. And particularly it is young women who at the cost of their own blood from time to time come to spread in front of the eyes of an different society, the hidden sufferings and covered wounds we pass by every day, but we have neither the heart nor the time to deal with, end of quote. Although feminists were passionately fighting for rights to education, paid employment, and more active roles in society on the pages of Armenian periodicals, the advocacy for improvement of family and women's rights, in, uh, we very rarely see that they actually advocated improvement of family and women's rights in marriage. Why were women silent about their personal status and marital rights? Uh, there can be... Um, uh, a number of reasons for this. One is the multi-layered power struggle within the Armenian community and with, with, between the Armenian community and the uh, Sultan that I can't cover right now because of time constraints, but this was perhaps one of the biggest obstacles. The other one was that uh, they had limited access to paid labor. So what would the woman do in the in that society if she didn't get married who was going to support her because it was the deal that they're first supported by their families mostly father as the breadwinner and later after marriage the husband would take care of their financial needs so women's choice for celibacy was practically impossible under the moral and material pressures and morally too a woman was expected to culturally she was expected to marry once she's reached that age uh, and as Denis Candioti has suggested for Muslim women, uh, this reservation is hardly surprising in a society which offered women no shelter outside the traditional family. Instead, the Armenian women took their critique of the family to a safer level, namely to the fictional literature in fictional language. The protagonist of the women's literary works was an educated woman aware of her rights. She was portrayed as no longer able to live in an extended family, no longer tolerant to arranged marriages and the confinement and no longer tolerant to the confinement of women to home. Women authors placed women's personal happiness at the center of the societal happiness. Women's success in the public life, as well as the well-being of the society at large, were rendered as dependent on women's personal happiness in marriage, because as Sibyl's heroine claims, quote, if the heart of a young woman is dead for her love, her heart is dead for the world, end of quote. So unfortunately, I cannot cover all these works, but I will just sum them up by saying that the analysis of women's literary works about marriage and family illustrates that public happiness and progress of the society were rendered as dependent on the private happiness of women as much as women's happiness was dependent on the progress of the society. So this uh, was an assertion that really fused the lines between the private, the public, the personal, and the political. And I will end here, uh, Anait, and I will take your questions if you think we still have time. Thank you, Dr. Halapian. I think uh, th this 
lecture has been extremely illuminating, at least for me, uh, and, and I'm sure for many people who just don't know as much about the, the women's rights movement. And I, I think I can speak for anyone who's watching that we would certainly want to uh, be a student in your, your classroom and, and learn more about this uh, fascinating topic. Um, I, I think what we'll do is we'll just end it here. And, um, and I will just say that uh, the next two um, uh, the next two lectures will be on the the present and the future, and those will take place uh, later this year. But I want to thank you so much for educating us about the the women's rights movement. Um, it, it gives us a glimpse into um, you know uh, to, to to so much, uh, and um, and and I think will inform you know, what's happening uh, certainly uh, in the present and, and, um, and the work of activists going forward. So, so thank you so much for, for your time thank and thank you, you to everybody much. who's watching for your attention and um, stay tuned for uh, the, next two, uh, the next two series which will take place later this year. Thank you very much, it was my pleasure.